2000s, the standard sentence in every article was, FTG PET CT is quantitative, it's accurate, it can have an impact on management, but it's not really available and it's very expensive. And then the next sentence was, and prospective studies are lacking. Always the same. This is the dogma. These are the dogmatic people. This is how it all started. And uh, some of you may remember Richard Nixon. He actually started the war on cancer. And that dates back to 1971, so fairly shortly before he was forced out of office. And uh, what he came up with uh, to finance the war on cancer was 1.6 billion billion dollars at that time. And what I'm always struck with when you look at the statistics on, on cancer survival is that not that much has actually changed. The, what has changed to a certain degree is the incidence of cancer, with some of them rising, like neuroendocrine tumors, for instance, but some of them really coming down, like now in the, in the uh, mo most recent data, lung cancer that is coming down, but overall survival rates are not that different. Part of it is due to the fact that we still don't detect it early enough, and part of it that we have not made uh, sufficient progress in cancer medications. We have made some progress, but it's, it's not sufficient to really make, make an impact. And then the question is, of course, can our diagnostic approaches help to improve the outcomes of cancer patients? And that is asking much from diagnostic modalities to really impact survival. This is something that was usually reserved for therapeutic options rather than diagnostic options. The presence and the extent of disease. And we can ask the question whether the cancer therapy works. This is an example that I like because it consists of a baseline scan. Then the patient receives what we call a targeted drug, which is one of these drugs that patients take orally side effects, but less side effects than uh, chemotherapy. Only certain patients qualify for these drugs. They need to have a certain mutation in their cancer cells to get this drug. But still, not all patients respond to this treatment. This is done within two weeks after start of treatment. This is all cancer. Two weeks after start of treatment, there's almost no activity seen, no glucose metabolic activity seen. And this is the late follow-up in these patients without evidence for cancer. So without knowing whether the treatment is effective or not is, in my view, criminal. So we shouldn't be doing this. In this case, you see that the patient has exploding disease even two weeks after uh, initiation of treatment with markedly increased glucose metabolic activity. This thing gets larger very quickly. This treatment doesn't work. So if there's any other treatment, you should use it rather than keep the patient on this treatment that is failing the patient. And that's the financial toxicity of the treatments. These are real statements. This is one from Novartis. They did develop a very, very expensive immunotherapy that in part can be extremely effective. But look at the numbers. It's $475,000 for a single infusion. This is really expensive to do. I completely agree with that. But the, the financial implications are significant. And that's the comment, while both uh, external and Novartis quantitative assessments of these values indicate that a cost-effective price could be $600,000 to $750,000 per infusion, we recognize the importance of this paradigm-shifting therapy and are setting the price as $475,000 for this one-time treatment. And that should make you wonder how society will do these kind of things. And it should make you realize that it is really important to have tools available that tell you early on whether treatments work or don't work. And I just listed this here. The annual cost of new cancer therapies in the United States is estimated at around $200,000 a year now. Now, that's probably double or more than what it costs in Europe, but the costs in Europe are still not negligible. If you continue treating with something that doesn't work, it's a pure waste of money, it's toxic, it's unnecessary, it's dangerous for the patient. So this is really the key questions. What are the cancer care cost drivers? This is again US numbers cost in billion dollars in 2010, 125 billion in 2020, it will be 165 billion per patient per year, costs on average $52,000. And here you look at the 
percent of total Medicare, which is the public insurance systems for people older than 65 in the United States, what the, what the cont contributors are. Inpatient admissions account for 24%. Of course, hospitals are expensive. We all, we all know that. Other outpatient services like labs, pathology, non-cancer related drugs, 21%. Chemotherapy and biologics, 20%. Cancer surgeries, 11%. Professional services, just physicians, physicians nurses, and so on, 8%. All radiology in this analysis, 6%. So imaging is the least suspicious perpetrator here. One more point before I go to the so-called evidence story, and that is the utilization of PET in cancer. And what I always found interesting about that, that we talk about overutilization. Why would you use PET? It's expensive. You overutilize it. Physicians, you know, order PET scans without a good reason. This uh, is a nice football score here. PET versus CT, 1 to 11. And that is in breast cancer during the first two years after diagnosis. 11 times more CT scans than PET scans. These are basically data that were published in JAMA, and they were published by an epidemiologist who does very, very good work. She's by no means biased for PET. In fact, in her conclusion, she mentions that the annual cost increases with PET are disproportionate to all others, and therefore one needs to be careful with PET. When in fact, the point is, you utilize MRI three times more frequently after the diagnosis, not for primary diagnosis, and you use CT 11 times more frequently than you use PET. As you know, many of you know, FTG PET is the standard of care in, in lymphoma. And even in lymphoma during the first two years after diagnosis, CT is used six times more frequent than PET during the first two years, but that's criminal. It's simply absolutely wrong, and it's bad for, for patients. Cancer expenditures at that time, $30.6 billion. Medicare data again. 4.6% of that goes to imaging. Remember, the other one showed 6%. We came up with 4.6%. PET accounted for 1% of cancer care costs. 1%, and that's how we create the big fuss about the cost of PET imaging. It's absolutely ridiculous. Do we detect enough of the disease and do we have a sufficiently low number of false positive, which is specificity? Do we have an incremental value over other tests? That's the diagnostic value. Therapeutic value, does your diagnostic test result in improved treatment? Now, Improved treatments do not necessarily mean improved survival. It can also be quality of life or something like that. And finally, individual and societal value. Does what you do in this case, PET imaging, result in improved survival, quality of life, cost effectiveness? That's a tall order for a diagnostic test. It's not what diagnostic tests are essentially designed to do. Are we sufficiently accurate? And this was met because in 85%, 90% of all the studies, PET-CT was more accurate than the individual components such as PET or CT alone. I think it's a kind of almost a cult, the evidence cult that we are subscribing to. Condition for an acceptance is of course whether, uh, result, whether a test results in improved therapy, improved quality of life and so on. And there's this issue with randomized trials, so there are some. I'll list some, so Van Tinteren in 2002, Fisher in lung cancer, uh, Ruiz in 2009, Herder in 2006. This was not a uh, randomized trial, but also an interesting trial. The evidence that PET works, that PET is useful, that it is accurate, that it helps patients, is absolutely overwhelming. There is no doubt about it. The recent editorial that came out in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine the, last week, maybe, and it's the, Rod Hicks calls it the injustice of being judged by the errors of others, the tragic tale of the battle for pet reimbursement. Why is it he, does he consider the tra tragic battle? Because what NOPRA did, this huge registry of three, 300,000 patients, was done in Australia, it is done in Canada, it is done in the United States, it was to a certain degree done in the UK, 
And in Germany, for instance, PET is still not reimbursed on a, on a broad level. It's an absolute healthcare scandal and it's a, it's a travesty. PET is not a major contributor to cancer care costs. I hope I showed you that. It is markedly underutilized and I didn't have time to show you cost effectiveness analysis, which is decision tree sensitivity analysis using quite advanced models has been introduced for PET imaging in the 90s already and showed that PET is cost effective across pretty much all conditions that you impose on the, on the, on the framework of these studies. It's time to really also have an argument with the people who propose evidence-based medicine because evidence-based medicine ignores one thing that has always been extremely important in medicine and that medicine has also a component of art to it. You might find that funny or hilarious or non-scientific, but art in medicine is something that every patient appreciates because they know that there are other things than just data that apply to groups of people that are important in managing patients. And when you look at this, this is a uh, breast cancer patient. I hope I get it. This is a breast cancer patient. This is the, the lesion in the left breast. This is neoadjuvant treatment before the patient undergoes surgery. This is the result that you want. That lesion loses its sugar uptake within one or two cycles of chemotherapy. That's the response that you want. If you don't get this, then you need to change your treatment. And if you don't change the treatment, you will give four, five, six cycles of chemotherapy that doesn't work and the patient and you don't even know it. And I think that's simply absolutely wrong and it's totally unacceptable. Coronary artery bypass surgery would not exist if we would have applied evidence-based medicine standards as they are applied now. Same for cardiac transplantation, stem cell transplant, renal transplant, liver transplant, CT imaging in cancer, trauma, MR imaging in anything, ultrasound imaging in anything plain film x-rays, nothing, no evidence-based medicine. Nobody needs it, very limited need. We don't need it. So what I always try to say is let's use common sense. And the common sense approach to me is people use things if they are useful. Yes, there will be outliers, and the outliers will kind of rip off the systems. But monitoring the whole system is much more expensive than allowing to identify a few outliers when they do when they do their rip-offs. So it's not worthwhile policing everything, creating evidence over years and years and years that deprives patients of the best uh, 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 patient care.